our speaker today, Ruchir, uh, doesn't need an introduction. He's a global, uh, well-known, reputed uh, author, speaker, and investor, and he knows uh, a lot about Sri Lanka as well. And um, I'm fortunate uh, to be in this kind of audience second time in the recent, when I was at Woodgarn also, he was here and delivered a lecture on his earlier book, uh, his um, uh, very famous <laughs> of writing, I think last one was um, the ten, uh, this one, 10 rules of the earlier book was Breakout Nations, I think <laughs> that's correct here. Yeah. So let me um, briefly uh, formally introduce uh, 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 Rochir, uh, Mr. Rochir Sharma is the chairman of Rockefeller International and founder and chief investment officer of Breakout Capital, an innocent firm focused on emerging markets. He has a lot of experience in emerging markets. And also someone who is putting real money into the market, so basically must, be, must have a better idea than anyone else, uh, other than like uh, academics uh, or others. He moved to Rockefeller in 2022 after a 25 year career at Morgan Stanley, in the management where he was well known, and where he was head of emerging markets and chief global strategist. Uh, Sharma has been a writer for longer than he has been an investor. At age 17, he started writing for India's largest economic daily, The Economic Times. His commentary has since appeared in Wall Street Journal, The Financial Times, The Washington Post, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, Bloomberg, and The Guardian, among others. He was a contributing opening opinion writer at The New York Times from 2016. To 2021, and is currently a contributing editor and columnist, columnist at the Financial Times. Based in New York and Miami, he travels frequently to different countries, meeting with leading politicians, CEOs, and other local characters who populate his writing. Sharma is the author of four books. His most recent, The Ten Rules of Successful Nation, was published by Norton in 2020. I think today. Thank for giving me a copy today. So it says we uh, is going to talk about uh, uh, this book today. It's an updated and abridged adoption of the rise and fall of nations, forces of change in the post-crisis world, which was released in 2016 and became a New York Times bestseller. In 2012, his first book, Breakout Nations, in pursuit of the next economic miracles, I think that's where he talked about this book here, when he was here in 2013, debuted as a number one bestseller in India and earned Sharma the Tata Literature Live First Book Award for 2012. Breakout Nations also made the Wall Street Journal hardcover business bestseller list and was chosen by foreign policy as one of, the, one of its 21 books to read in 2012. The World Economic Forum cited Sharma as one of its top young leaders in 20, 20, 2007. In 2012, foreign policy magazine cited Sharma as one of its top, top global thinkers and the following year, India's premier weekly magazine Outlook named him as one of the world's 25 smartest Indians. Bloomberg ranked Ruchir among the world's 50, 50, world's 50 most influential people in 2015. The following year, GQ India named Sharma as Sharma the Global Indian of the Year and Barons put him on the cover as Wall Street's new global thinker. Sharma is passionate about politics and has covered every national election in India and many major state contests. Going back to 1988, he, he led the first trip with three journalist friends and Pakistan has since grown to 20 regulars and few guest travelers and this time also he is here with a similar group of people as I was told just before. They typically travel a thousand miles over a week and have interviewed any everyone from local voters to national leaders, including Narendra Modi and the Gandhis. These travels are captured in his 2019 book, Democracy on the Road, 25-year journey through India. I think it's a very practical experience with 
with ideas from all the le all levels. And also, very interestingly, he has other interests as well. Other interests include athletics, and he continues to train for the 100 and 200 meter sprints. No matter where he is in the world or how hectic his schedule, he tries not to miss a single day of training. In 2011, he represented India in the World Masters Athletic Championship in Sacramento. Sam has also keen interest in wildlife and cinema and attends international film festivals and he can find a moment away from interesting writing and running. We got interesting character, very diverse interests and also we are very fortunate to have him today. I can invite Rajiv to be your first speaker. Thank you. Thanks so much for the kind introduction. I first came to Sri Lanka back in 1997. Uh, always with the same person, Mary Ann Page. Uh, so thank you, Mary Ann, for always setting this up. So that was back in 1997. And then I've been to Sri Lanka a bunch of times after that. Uh, it's a country that I've always emotionally connected with. I've, I love coming here uh, whenever I can. And even this New Year's Eve uh, decided that if I had to come and vacation anywhere in the world, it had to be Sri Lanka. And on the back of that, took the opportunity to come and meet uh, the governor, later the president, and everyone uh, who is here to continue my journey of the uh, country uh, that in many ways is so charming and remarkable. A country I wrote about extensively as well in my book, uh, Breakout Nations, which came out in 2012. Um, what I thought I'd do today is to speak about my latest book because I thought it may be relevant for Sri Lanka in particular or in general. Uh, that after having traveled the world and studied various countries, my effort was to come up with what are the 10 most important things that matter to determine if a nation is likely to be successful or not be that successful over the foreseeable future. And as the governor was introducing and he mentioned that I'm a practitioner, it's a bit different from being an academic. One of the issues I have with academics often when they write books is that the history they're taking or the forecast they're making is almost impractical. Uh, like as the governor knows, and I think many of you here know in the government as well, that uh, most practitioners have a time horizon of maybe three years, four years, five years. We don't have the liberty of saying that, hey, come and check how our forecast will be or what the prognosis of the country will be 50 years from now. So they said that the old rule of forecasting used to be that you make as many forecasts as possible and keep reminding people when you're right. The new rule of forecasting, especially in the world of academia, is that you forecast so long out in the future that neither you nor I will be here to know whether I was right or wrong. So keeping that in mind, what I tried to do was to come up with 10 rules to figure out which nations are likely to do well or not do well over a realistic time horizon, which I think is, you know, three, five years maximum up to 10 years. And you have to also keep in mind that if you look at the history of development around the world, there are about 200 countries in the world. Of these 200 countries, only 40 countries or so are classified as developed countries. All the other countries, 160 or so, are classified as emerging markets. And most of them, from Brazil to Mexico to all sorts of countries in Africa, they've been emerging forever, which is that they have a growth spurt for a while, and then they falter. Very few of them are able to truly break out and become developed countries. In fact, the last major country to become a developed country after being an emerging country was possibly South Korea back in the 1990s. After that, a few small countries in Eastern Europe have become developed countries, but most countries, unfortunately, are never able to break out, sustain growth, and become proper developed countries. Unfortunately, that's also what we have seen in Sri Lanka, that there's been so much promise and so, so many things in terms of the quality of human capital out here, the education levels, that you want to believe that Sri Lanka 
should by now have become the model for Southeast, uh, you know, for South Asia in many ways. But unfortunately, Sri Lanka too has been stuck in this trap where you get a few good years and then after that, a lot of the gains are given away. And as a result, its per capita income, particularly relative to the U.S., has uh, really not moved much uh, for decades. Uh, the the gap has only widened. It's not it's not been able to close, which is what is uh, like obviously has been a bit disappointing but that's history so let's try and look at how sri lanka ranks today but more importantly what are the 10 rules and then you can judge for your own that how does sri lanka qualify on those 10 rules so these are the 10 rules in a snapshot from population to politics to the state debt currency investment inflation geography inequality and sentiment and i'll try and walk through all of these 10 rules and see uh, in terms of you know where Sri Lanka ranks and for you to gauge as to where the country is on these 10 rules. So what I did was that we on many of these rules we back tested them to see that uh, which ones work and which don't work. There are some rules which you will not find here which you think are obvious like education and that's because over short time horizons or what I call realistic time horizons, things like education don't have any predictive power. They may have predictive power over 50 or 100 years. They don't have any predictive power over how a country is likely to do over the next 5 or 10 years. And sometimes it's a chicken egg story that often a country's education level increases with economic development and growth rather than the other way around. So these are more forward looking indicators over a 3, 5 year time horizon and I said up to 10 year time horizon. The first rule has to do with demographics. If you look at the growth typically of the global economy, about one third comes from demographics and the other two third comes from productivity in under very broad categories. So in, in, in a way, this is the first rule of demographics and population accounts about one third of the explanatory factor for economic growth. All the nine others help explain productivity in some way or the other. That's the way to think about it. So population, I think this is a very important point. No country in the history of economic development has been able to grow without good demographics. What do I mean by good demographics? It means countries which are have their population and working age population, people between the age of 15 and 64, that needs to be growing at at least 2% for the country to be able to sustain an economic growth rate above 6%. Now demographics is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for high economic growth. You have so many countries in Africa, Middle East, with very good demographics, so to speak, but they were, they were never able to convert that demographic dividend into anything significant. Even China, India for a long time were not able to do that. So if you look at it here, that uh, for, for a country in terms of, you know, we looked at 200 countries in the last seven decades and 42 of those countries had a po working age population growth of more than 2% which were able to grow at a sustained pace of 6%. If it is less than zero, virtually no hope because and the three countries which were an exception to this were countries which were recovering from some wars, so just catching up. So 2% working age population growth is what you typically need to sustain economic growth of 6% of more, which is what I define as an economic miracle space. So look at the countries here. Which are the countries today where the working age population is growing by more than 2%? As you can see here, it's mainly in Africa. Uh, where this is happening and countries like Pakistan. Now the problem with many of these countries is they have good demographics but everything else is bad. So they're not able to do that. Sri Lanka's case also now if you notice the working age population projected to grow over the next 5-10 years is just 0.1% a year. That's a very low level. So it means that you almost need to do something else to offset this. So it's very difficult for Sri Lanka to grow at a rate of more than 6% when your working age population is only growing at 0.1% unless you're catching up for the past. So you can do it you know, for a while or you have to rely on more immigration or on much greater automation uh, or you have to increase the retirement age 
uh, for uh, the labor force participation to increase or the female participation in the labor force has to go up because typically in no country in the world is the female labor force participation at the same rate as the male participation. So that's one lever you can use to lift economic growth. But you can see here that Sri Lanka's working age population is uh, projected to grow at just 0.1, which countries are growing very rapidly. And on the other hand, you have so many countries now in the world where the working age population is in fact shrinking. And that's the biggest detriment now for China. That, you know, there's so much talk about what's happening in China and all the politics and everything. But one of the biggest drags on growth in China now is the fact that its working age population is shrinking, in fact, in China. That's a big negative for China. In fact, there are nearly 50 countries in the world now where the working age population is shrinking. So this is a big demographic shift that has happened. Because in the 1980s, we were all concerned about the population bomb. There were just one or two countries where the working age population was shrinking. I think Afghanistan, Somalia, basically who cares, right? So everywhere else, the working age population was increasing. So this is a big change uh, around the world. And even Sri Lanka has to... Uh, adjust for that. The second is politics. Uh, this is something which I've seen that if you notice, this is something I've seen in emerging markets in particular. Most countries carry out economic reform only when they have an economic crisis. Very few countries carry out economic reform when things are good. Because when things are good, you tend to get complacent. Problem is most countries are caught in what I call the circle of life. That they carry out economic reforms when they have a crisis, then you get a revival. Once you get a revival, then complacency tends to set in. Once complacency sets in, that often leads to the next crisis uh, because you fritter away a lot of the gains. Uh, and something I think Sri Lanka too has been used to being caught in this circle for many decades or so. The other question people ask me. So, the good news here is this, that typically when you have a crisis and when a new leader is elected, that is when you get the maximum bang for the buck in terms of reforms, change. That's what happens because then the population is also ready to back the reformer. Sometimes the population is not ready to back the reformer if you don't have a crisis. Because then they're like, why are you doing something which is... Because reforms are often painful to start because you're uh, unlocking something. So often people are like, why are we being forced to carry out reforms when there's no problem? But when you have a crisis and a new leader comes to power, that's when you get the maximum economic reforms. And that's something we have seen across the world as well. That if you look at the countries which reformed, they often did it under crisis. Even India, 91 or whenever they've carried out the maximum reforms, it was under crisis. But then it's like how you build on that because so many countries carry out reforms and then the crisis goes away and then you're cruising and then you go away and waste everything by spending it all and you get back into a crisis mode. The other question a lot of people ask me that are, is democracy or authoritarian regime better for economic growth? That's a question people often ask me because there is this common perception that under an authoritarian regime or dictatorial regime, you can carry out reforms because you can use the stick and you can use it very heavily to get what you want implemented. Uh, what I show here is that if you look at under democracy and authoritarian regime, the growth outcome is roughly equal, right? That, they, that you get GDP growth of more than 5%. Uh, if you look at which countries achieved that, both did it with uh, half were democracies, half were authoritarian regimes. But here is the very important uh, differentiation, which is that under authoritarian regimes, you tend to get much more volatile outcomes. If you have the right policies, you end up getting a boom, fine. If you end up with the wrong policies, you end up getting a bust. Because there's no one to check you, no one to tell you that something wrong is happening in your country. So under democracy and authoritarian regimes, the growth outcome, if you look at it, is roughly the same. But under authoritarian regimes, the outcomes tend to be much more unpredictable depending on the whims and fancies of the leader. Where you either get, end up a boom or a bust. Under a democracy, you end up getting a much more steady growth. Uh, and that over time compounds much better.
The third rule I look at, that is the size of the state too big or too small, right? Because that you can only spend as much as what your wealth, your per capita income of a country allows you to do so. So you look at a country's spending as a share of GDP and where it is relative to the entire um, uh, world. So here you notice that Sri Lanka's spending as a share of GDP is now under control. Spending is not the problem. We know taxes is the problem. The tax as a share of GDP is very low. At least spending is not a problem anymore in Sri Lanka like it used to be. So that's under control. In which countries is spending very high as a share of GDP relative to the per capita income? Brazil, Kuwait, Colombia, Latin American countries and some in the EMEA region. In which countries is the state relatively well uh, balanced and you can see almost too small is in some of the East Asian countries. So in East Asian countries people speak a lot about how those countries have a lot of state intervention, maybe, but if you look at the state spending as a share of GDP, it's relatively under control. Uh, here we have a look at the fact that how responsible were countries after the uh, pandemic happened because often what countries do is spend in haste and then repent in leisure. Many of the countries which spent very heavily uh, after the pandemic suffered serious consequences because they spent so many of the bullets, monetary, fiscal, intervention that distorted the economies. So here's a sample of which economies uh, in emerging markets spent much more than the average and which were relatively responsible in terms of how much they spent. Fourth point is debt. Uh, now debt is key because often and yeah, but it, like we all know that debt can be a problem. What I did in terms of the analysis is to analyze when is debt a problem, what kind of debt is a problem and what the sort of uh, all the research I did showed was that it is when a country takes on too much debt over a five-year time horizon that country almost always gets into trouble. Either growth slows down because you're borrowing from the future or you have a financial crisis because if you make too many loans over a short span of time then those loans tend to go bad much more quickly. Uh, because you often end up making loans to uh, the wrong people or without vetting the, role, uh, uh, the loans quite uh, well. Sri Lanka, in terms of it, mainly because of the government, you have seen debt go up uh, over the last five years. But you have other countries where, in fact, they have deleveraged. The single most successful story of a crisis country which has come back has been Greece. Uh, that Greece you, it was the basket case of Europe uh, nearly 10 years ago. Today, Greece is the shining star of Europe. Uh, and something which maybe there's a lot, you know, like for uh, to be learnt in terms of how they followed the right policies, got the debt under control, uh, cleaned up the, fi the fiscal excesses, and then of course relied a lot on tourism and other exports to boost the economy. So Greece in terms of has been the shining example out here as far as debt is concerned. And the one thing you have to always look at is that when you look at the debt level, you have to always see as to how much you can afford. What is your wealth? What is your per capita income? And this is again China's biggest problem. As I said, that China has been the single biggest success story in the history of economic development. From 1978 right up until four or five years ago, China was the biggest role model for economic success in the world, growing at nearly 10%. No country has lifted so many people out of poverty like China did. But the problem that China is running into now, I've already said one is demographics, and the second has to do with the fact that its debt levels went up a lot. China tried to keep growing at a pace of 5 6%, well above its underlying potential given the trends in demographics and productivity to hit some random growth target of 5 or 6%. In doing so, it took up a lot of debt to grow and now it's being the consequences of it because there's a huge debt build up in China and the government doesn't know how exactly to clean it up 
without breaking the entire system. On the other hand, countries in the Middle East, Eastern Europe, you find that the uh, debt levels are relatively low and well managed. Currency. A key to economic success, especially for emerging markets, is to have a cheap and stable currency. Something again China demonstrated so effectively that it had a very cheap and effective currency for a long period of time. Now how do you define cheap? This is a su subject of much economic debate. Some, you know that, firstly when you travel to the country the currency needs to feel cheap. And then you can look at some of the more sophisticated analysis like real effective exchange rate, current account and PPP to figure out if a currency is undervalued or overvalued. So this is an interesting thing as that, you know, how much does a burger cost when you travel to different countries like a burger and a coffee, which countries feel very cheap? Turkey, Egypt, South Africa, all places where I want to plan my next vacation. Uh, so next year and I'm going to Egypt. Uh, it's like pretty economical just now. And which countries feel quite expensive when you travel? In fact, many of these countries have a pegged exchange rate to the US dollar. The dollar today is very expensive. So those currencies in particular feel quite expensive when you travel to. Um, the current account is obviously something else you look as a measure because if, you, if your currency is cheap and competitive then you should ideally be running very large current account surpluses, your exports should be doing quite well. Uh, most places where the current accounts today are large though tend to be oil exporting countries. The only exception there is Taiwan because it's done so successful on the chips front. As I said, if there are two countries which I ranked in breakout nations as the, uh, the goals medalists of economic development at that time. And those were Korea and Taiwan. That book I wrote in 2012. 10, 11 years later, I'd say Taiwan has done even better than Korea because of its technological success and prowess. And also the fact that it maintained a pretty stable, cheap uh, exchange rate and is able to export chips like pretty much no other country is able to do. So that's what is a good telltale sign. The problem is, again, for countries which are not able to uh, export that much. Uh, and on, but generally the rule I find is that your current account deficit as a share of your GDP in today's day and age, anything more than 3% is a red flag. Uh, 3%. In the olden days, it used to be 5%. But now as capital flows around the world have shrunk, FDI flows have fallen, anything more than 3% current account deficit as a share of GDP is a red line. The sixth I look at uh, has to do with uh, investment. That most successful countries have an investment as a share of their GDP of about 25 to 35%. Uh, that's the sweet spot for investment as a share of GDP. And the big chunk of that investment tends to be manufacturing. And most successful countries have a manufacturing base as a share of their GDP of about 20% or so. Uh, because if you look at the single biggest success that emerging markets which were able to grow rapidly had was they were able to export their way to prosperity particularly by having very strong manufacturing good exports. Uh, today if you look at the world you have South Africa, Colombia with very low investment as a share of GDP. Countries like Indonesia, even India now, uh, Chile, Saudi Arabia are in the sweet spot. And where it's almost too high is China, Qatar and stuff. That means that they're almost over investing. And when you over invest, then the returns on capital don't tend to be that good. So those are countries which are over investing out there. So, and what we found was that when you have very high investment rates, you get very good economic growth until you over invest and then the returns begin to fall. Uh, so that's what this ec ec uh, economic trick exercise suggests, that when investment to GDP peaks above 30% and then begins to fall, then you get a big slowdown in growth. But the key here again, 25 to 35% is the key sweet spot for how much uh, investment as a share of GDP is good for your country and manufacturing as a subset of that typically about 20% uh, is the threshold you know which is considered a good level uh, to do well. Inflation. Uh, 
again, we look at the fact that where is inflation sort of there? And here Sri Lanka has had a huge success story, which is that inflation was such a massive problem in this country. Uh, and, you know, because of reigning in the monetary expansion and, and having a good monetary policy framework, now inflation has really fallen in the last few months in Sri Lanka. On the other hand, Argentina, Turkey, Egypt, Pakistan, look at their inflation rates, still well out of control. So those countries still have a lot of adjustment to do, at least here in Sri Lanka, a lot of adjustment has been made and inflation now is under control. Now this is all related. Countries which typically have a very high investment rate, also tend to have a relatively low inflation rate because you're putting up enough capacity to meet demand. But countries which have a low investment rate, they you know, have much more consumption and that's not good for their inflation. The other thing which you also have to do is to watch out for asset price inflation. Most central bankers are still stuck in this old framework where they focus a lot on consumer price inflation. But you have to also see asset price inflation, property prices, stock prices. If those rise too much and they're backed by a lot of financing of debt, that's also a problem because if you look at most economic downturns in post-World War II history, they're caused by asset price bubbles deflating. So looking at asset price inflation is as important as looking at consumer price inflation. The eighth point I come to is geography. Geography is very important, which is that you have to be in the right sweet spot. Uh, and you know, m many countries which have done well often have done well, especially small countries, if they're in the right trade routes, because they're able to benefit so much from that. Sri Lanka obviously has such a great advantage on that front, which has not been fully exploited. But uh, whether it's the right trade routes, right airport uh, transfer routes, just being in the right geographical sweet spot is helpful. There's a big problem though in South Asia in general, which is that South Asia uh, also doesn't trade much with each other. The countries here don't trade much with each other, which is a very unique problem because only Africa and South Asia have very low intra-regional trade. That's because of geopolitical issues and differences. Most successful regions in good geography have lots of trade with yeah, each other. But the two regions with very little intra-regional trade are Africa and South Asia. So that's a bit of a uh, headwind uh, for this uh, region. And the other thing in today's day and age you want is countries, because remember globalization is changing. It's not just about trade. It's also got to do with the amount of digital uh, networks and the transfer taking place through that. And so that's got to do with the external geography, that being in the right geographical sweet spot and exploiting that is very helpful. There's one other point I'll make to you about internal geography, which I found very helpful, which is that if you look at most successful countries in the world, the growth tends to be spread out internally. It's not concentrated in one large city or one big metropolitan area. Uh, so, but some countries where growth tends to be very concentrated in one area often tend to face greater internal strife. Thailand is a leading example of that. That so much of Thailand, you know, is a relatively large country with a population of 70, 80 million, yet a lot of the population is there in Bangkok. And a thumb rule I have is that the ratio between your largest city and your second largest city, the population ratio should typically not be more than three to one, maximum four to one. And when it is too concentrated in one place, it leads to a lot of resentment in the other regions. In the developed world too, France has a problem because of that, that Paris, the ratio is six to one in terms of population compared to the second largest city of Lyon. In UK too, it's a bit of a problem where the largest city is uh, London and then the second largest city, the ratio of population is one fourth that of London. Uh, the successful countries, you have like, whether it's got to do with, you know, uh, countries in um, uh, Europe, uh, such as uh, Germany or, it, uh, or even like other countries like Switzerland, the population is much better spread out.
rather than being too concentrated in one place. I think Sri Lanka is like a uh, problem as well. One of them is the fact that so much of the population is around the Colombo area and after Colombo there really isn't any big urban center. So that's another thing which you have to think about how to create new cities, new urban centers. China of course was very successful at doing that. N the number of new cities which came up was incredible. India has been much less successful in creating new cities but generally in countries with a population of up to 100 million I would say the ratio between the largest city and the second largest city the population ratio should not be more than three or four to one so in India I do the same work of the states in India and with states in India because most states in India are the sizes of large countries so with states in India are very imbalanced and there's too much concentration uh, in just one city like uh, it's a problem with uh, Karnataka, it's a problem with West Bengal, whereas some of the other places uh, like uh, the population spread is much better. Uh, and the other thing, the ninth rule I come with is inequality. Too much inequality is not great for a country because that's what again lays the seeds for uh, political backlash and economic social backlash and the support for capitalism or opening markets then reduces because when most of the population thinks that only a few people are benefiting from uh, capitalism or opening up of markets. So for most countries what I did was to look at the number of billionaires they have and to see if the billionaire wealth is too large as a share of the economy or the number of billionaires being created, in which industries are they coming up? Are they coming up in industries where they're able to create uh, wealth on their own or they're coming up in industries where they need government help to try and create their wealth, which is common in places like Russia. And the other thing is that you want many more self-made billionaires than who just inherit their wealth. Nothing wrong in inheriting it, but you don't want the ratio to be too lopsided one way or the other. And of course, I don't think Sri Lanka has any billionaires, so it's not relevant uh, there. But generally, if you look at the world, these are the countries where you find uh, that the billionaire wealth is a share of the, the economy is very high. Uh, the number of good versus bad billionaires is very high and a lot of inherited billionaires are there, uh, which, you know, like generally is not a good sign. So Russia, of course, uh, has no inherited billionaires because it only adopted capitalism in the 1990s. But how poorly Russia ranks on the other two. Chile is another country which ranks very poorly. Uh, India is mixed on two out of the four, uh, sorry, or two out of the three. It has a bit of a bad score, very high billionaire wealth as a share of GDP. And also a lot of them have inherited the wealth. But bad versus good, meaning in terms of in productive industries versus extractive industries, the ratio has improved in recent years. On the other hand, look at countries like Poland uh, or Hungary, Eastern Europe kind of countries where a lot of the wealth is self-generated and uh, it's mostly in industries like manufacturing, technology, which is self-made rather than with government help. My last point, sentiment. I think that uh, this is a bit of a contrarian point, which is that countries which are gloating too much or basking in too much adulation often tend to get much, uh, often tend to get very complacent. So, and countries on the other hand, which are being criticized and are going through a crisis, uh, they are the ones who often carry out reforms, as I said. So one contrarian indication, which I did was that if you look at the Time magazine cover stories, that whenever a country makes it to the cover of a Time magazine in a good way, historically, it tends to be a bad omen. On the other hand, whenever someone makes to the cover of Time magazine in a sort of crisis way, that often tends to be the bottom for that country. Uh, because by the time a popular magazine appreciates the economic problems or appreciates the economic success of a country, it may be too late. So I look at this more as a contrarian indicator for which countries do you, that you should look at this in a contrarian way or not. Uh, so, and as I say, the opposite of love is not hate necessarily, but indifference. So when people aren't talking about too much of a country, like last year, you know, we were putting money in Poland and people would ask me, Poland, why Poland? Great sign because people haven't yet discovered it and are still sort of skeptical of it. On the other hand, I, 
Most of our rules rank very well for India today. But if I have one concern about India, it's about the fact that everybody loves India and appreciates how good the story is. So from a contrarian standpoint, at least on one rule, uh, like India would sco score relatively low just because everybody loves it. So the whole issue here is, but again, it's important in this entire framework that I've uh, taken through, which is that you have to look at all the 10 rules together not just one or two. When you put these countries together, here is a reading of which countries rank as good, which rank as average, and which rank as really ugly. So Indonesia, Brazil, Greece, Poland, even Sri Lanka today generally score well. The ugly countries which rank poorly, Egypt, Pakistan, Taiwan, Czech, Colombia, means that on many counts of the 10 rules, it's not scoring that well. So this is how we score countries. I keep doing this exercise with my team all the time to try and figure out which countries it makes sense to allocate capital to, which countries it doesn't make sense to allocate capital to. And here is it what we, I mean, how Sri Lanka generally ranks on the 10 rules to conclude. On population, it's a bit below average. The working age population is growing very slowly. Politics is middling because you have an election coming up, so you don't know which way the election is going to go. Last year, politics, Sri Lanka would have ranked very well. State, Sri Lanka's rank is relatively poor because of the fact that tax as a share of GDP is so low. Debt is in the middle. Currency, it ranks pretty well because it's very cheap just now and quite competitive, even though the current account is not yet in surplus, which is what you expect a crisis country to eventually have because that's usually the trigger for getting more flows. Investment in the middle. Inflation, it ranks relatively well. Geography, it's not being able to fully capitalize on it. And the internal geography problem is the fact that too much of the wealth is concentrated or too much around the Colombo area, not enough in the other areas. Sentiment also, Colombo, uh, Sri Lanka ranks relatively well from a contrarian standpoint that very few people outside are talking about Sri Lanka much, meaning that there's a lot of indifference about it, which means that expectations are very low and there's plenty of potential to surprise on the upside. So generally, I'd say Sri Lanka ranks relatively well at this standpoint. Uh, from an investment perspective, of course, there are issues about liquidity and other things, but things have, this is a big improvement over the last couple of years. And now, of course, the big takeaway is what happens on politics. And once the political situation is even stable, then the key for Sri Lanka is going to be how, what is going to be your growth engine? Because as I said, the classic growth engine was manufacturing exports. That was the classic growth engine for countries of Sri Lanka's per capita income to grow rapidly. But with that growth engine looking difficult, what can be the growth engine for Sri Lanka to grow even at 5%? 6 7% seems very difficult given the demographics of the country. But how do you get to a 5% at least economic growth rate uh, you know, like from here. And a lot of this should be just catch up for the time lost in the last few years given the crises that the country has gone through. So that really is my sort of takeaway. Uh, these are the 10 rules I look at uh, and try to evaluate countries all the time on these 10 uh, rules. And it's a dynamic process. And I just thought I'd share these today uh, with you uh, as just a consultative kind of uh, uh, presentation. Thank you.